Hello, I'm Katie Jarvis. This week, Real Foot Forward is made possible by our friends at Final Flight Outfitters, the family-owned outdoor store that has all the apparel and outdoor equipment you need for your next hunting or fishing trip. Visit finalflight.net for more information. On today's episode, Scott talks with Dr. Adam Wilson, who is the director of UT Martin Online, as well as a huge history buff, especially African-American history during the World Wars. He also talks about his passion of helping students and faculty with online education and research. I'm Scott Williams, host of Real Foot Forward where every week we celebrate our little section of the South and just like at our museum and Heritage Park here in Union City, Tennessee, we explore the culture, the spirit, the accomplishments, and the incredibly interesting heritage of West Tennessee. My guest for this episode, Dr. Adam Wilson, is the director of UT Martin Online, but he's also a historian, and he's written a really interesting book on African Americans and World me. War One. Welcome, Doctor Wilson. So, uh, first of all, tell me a little bit just about your very, very, very uh, past. You know, well, I'm a where, local where guy, so I'm from Martin, actually you know, originally. Parents, things like that. Um, my father worked for the university, and uh, my mother was a school teacher here locally. Um, so, so being an educator kind of made sense. Uh, actually, my whole family is educators. My brother teaches now at Westview High School. And um, so, yeah, I was around here, went to UT Martin as an undergrad, um, went off to do some graduate work, met my wife there, and then we were kind of gone from this area for about a decade and uh, moved back here about eight years ago um, and worked with the university with our extended campuses, um, uh, our, our centers, and I was mainly at the Jackson Center teaching. And uh, about four years ago, I got the opportunity to come back to the main campus and be the online director and so I've been doing that, and as mentioned to y'all earlier, um, you know, I really like to talk history because it's one of those things where I'm still passionate about it, but I don't get the chance. I still teach a couple of classes, but not quite as much as, as I used to. Yeah, so you were you interested in history, like, from in high school, and or when, when did you first— the history book, When did the yeah, history book It was one of those bite. things where when we went on family vacations, a lot of times it was road trips, and we traveled to, you know, Monticello or, or Mount Vernon or— uh, Civil War battlefields, just you know, museums. That was something that they were passionate about and really enjoyed, and and so I kind of got it naturally from them. Uh, actually, I, I had some some thoughts about being a math teacher, and uh, my brother was still doing the history thing, and he kind of is the one who who converted me back into it uh, before I kind of started my professional career with history. But yeah, always been interested in history, always really enjoyed kind of the cause and effect, um, trying to to you know determine why we think about things the way we think about them and, and kind of what our culture is um, and, and what's kind of led to that that you know national sense of culture or, or maybe, uh, for me, African-American culture, uh, African-American community. It's, um, it, that's sort of an unusual choice for somebody, you know, who's um, not African-American, who's living in a rural uh, community. At what point did you start to really become I think interested that, in, that in um, part, African-American um, history? It was sparked because I, I did like military history. And so in reading through military history, that was one of the stories that I didn't see a lot um, coming up was the African-American narrative. And, and then really just a sense of social justice. I guess what excites me the most whenever I'm writing is, is – um, you know, really seeing how these African Americans put into action uh, a plan for gaining civil rights. Uh, I really like the attorneys. I like the, the the legal side of it, and how they they built this case law for you know thirty years before getting to Brown versus Board of Education. And so, just to to see someone really be that meticulous and think through those things and figure that out just fascinates me. Because you know, uh, I, I do think I'm an intelligent person, but but I don't think of things in you know three decades in the future, right? Uh, same thing when you think about the founding fathers and, and when they're establishing you know, sure. the Constitution. To do something that that's endured so long, to, to do it in a way that it could endure, uh, it's just amazing to me. And, and so it's just, I guess, uh, I'm in awe of them. And so there was that kind of thing in terms of African-Americans seeing how they went about, you know, fighting this fight. And and really, you know, some of the unsung people that, that maybe you don't see in history books, those are the ones that I always wanted to kind of pick up their voice and try to carry it forward. 
And was this an interest while you were going to UT Martin and as part of your college studies? Yes, um, did you it, it was one of those things actually area, where, was it later? kind of as you mentioned, not being African-American, when I got to graduate school, some of my, my professors there tried to kind of maybe direct me in other areas. But I had done some research here at UT Martin, and, and really that was my passion. And so I tried, you know, there were different times, okay, I'm going to maybe focus on this research topic. And I just wasn't, I didn't think I would put in the work. Um, to to really do that full dissertation and, and to do that in-depth research. And so I kept kind of coming back to African-American history. And it's just the thing I'm most interested in and most passionate about. And so that's why I couldn't get away from it. I, I wasn't al- allowed to, I guess. I didn't let myself. And so the book that you ended up uh, writing is fascinating to me, and I'm, I've been so excited to have you come in here so you can tell us about it. <laughs> Usually, I like to spend more time talking about the past, but let's jump right ahead. You know, let's with you. Let's talk about your book and how, w- where did the glimmer of the idea about World War One come from? And you know, what? Ha, ha, tell me okay. about how you ended so, up getting to um, the point where you wanted with to the write book, this book. I it was an initial paper that I had written at uh, UT Martin, and just in general, African American military experience in World War One. It was much more nuts and bolts, numbers, you know, uh, however many troops served, how what capacities they served in, that type of thing. Uh, and in doing research on that, uh, there were a couple of books that mentioned Fort Des Moines and these African-American officers. And this was the first time that really in mass, the United States military allowed African-Americans to become uh, first lieutenants through captains. And so in these books uh, that were very good books, they'd have, you know, maybe a paragraph about these individuals, and they would use statements, you know, that this was the the vanguard or the leadership group that carried things into the modern civil rights movement, but there was no detail on how that happened. And so to me, it was one of those things of, I trust this person. I mean, they obviously have have done their research, but but where's the proof? And uh, so that's what kind of really sparked me doing the research. And so I kind of cheat because, like I said, I I love doing military history, but my book is not really, if if you're a military historian, you may not like my book because about half of it talks about kind of getting to the point where we have this officer training camp and the struggles they went to and some, some bureaucracy there. And then, you know, it talks about about one chapter of what actually is happening over in France. And then it goes to the aftermath of the war and really talks about how these men came back and really served in the civil rights movement. And so uh, it does focus on these men who were attorneys, um, some were educators, some were authors, um, some stayed in the military. And so really it just kind of goes through these men's lives and talks about what they did after – uh, the influences and experience they had in war and how that really affected them and impacted them to come back and and really strive to bring about civil rights. So these so these uh, men who um, were Americans who were you know discriminated against who you know uh, decided to enlist. What kind of experience did well, they have? There's two parts kind of what you're saying. So, so first, the the desire to enlist, it was a debate. I mean, it was one of those things where both white and black America debated what role would African Americans have in World War One. It's kind of funny to me because if you go back and look at the history of African American military experience, you see valiant service from you know uh, our original wars. I mean, you could really start with the American Revolution. But there's a debate there. You know, George Washington doesn't want to have black troops at first. And it's really uh, when the British and Lord Dunmore begin enlisting slaves and promising their freedom that Washington says, okay, we got to do this too, or else we're going to have just a mass of, of, you know, combatants against us that we can't match. And so you have that kind of going through all this history. And, you know, the Civil War, you think about with really creation of, of colored troops and colored units. And, and then, you know, you had this this period before World War One, and we're fighting in in the Native American and the Indian Wars out in the West and, and fighting in the Spanish-American War. But still, there's a question. And so it's, it's a question, of course, in the white community, but also in the black community. We've served valiantly. We've served with the anticipation that this was going to bring about equality, and it hasn't. And so should we just kind of give up on that dream and just say— this war is not about us, not about equality. Let's just stay at home. And, and, and W.B. Du Bois is one of the strongest voices that says, no, this is our war and, and this is our country. And so we should be fighting in this war. But those men, you know, they, they really, they made that choice. And, and, and it was a discussion. It was a debate. But ultimately, they did make the decision to, to go ahead and to create this officer training camp, to fight for that and have it created, uh, and then experience what they did in the military. Now, in terms of discrimination, um, they did face discrimination. 
the the fort being in Des Moines, Iowa, you would think that that's the north, you know, and the narrative kind of that that a lot of people think of is, well, most racism only occurred in the south. Well, that's not true. There was a segregated part of Des Moines. They faced segregation in things like the local theater, local uh, restaurants and other businesses. So they're facing that while they're there. But they're used to that. I, I don't want to excuse it, but I mean, they're used to facing, you know, discrimination and segregation. In the military, where they had the most problem with it. And, and what we see is a lot of these men were very well educated. They were mostly already past 25 years of age and had college degrees. That was one of the actual requests that the War Department made before creating the segregated officer training camp. So they had lives, they had families, you know, that they weren't going to be, you know, uh, maybe as discriminated against as, as someone younger who, who might not understand their rights. But, you know, the, they, they face things like uh, being issued old Union uniforms from the Civil War instead of being, you know, given regular uniforms. Um, a lot of times uh, they would actually have these camps and they would put a black camp about a mile or two away. And so you're thinking about the ridiculousness of this because we're in a war and every dollar counts. I mean, you're wanting to use all money towards the war effort. And instead, we're building a separate segregated camp to keep blacks and whites from intermixing. At the camps, they had what they called a safe ratio, which was basically about 10%. So you'd have, you know, 25,000 white troops to 2,500 black troops because there was still a fear of arming African-Americans and that there might be this revolution and, of course, kind of the propaganda and stereotypes that you hear about throughout this era, um, you know, things that these black men are going to go and rape and pillage and, and all these type of things. That was all real, and that was, that was, those were questions. There, there, there's letters you can go find in the National Archives where people write their, you know, senators and congressmen saying, we don't want black men in this local camp because they have those stereotypes and, and that racism. So th they definitely faced quite a bit of racism here in, in our nation in training. Uh, the 92nd Division did not train as a division until they reached France. Uh, the 93rd Division was never uh, serving as a, a division completely. Basically, whenever they get over to France, they're attached to French units, and so they're, they're separated out. 95% of African Americans that went to World War I were service of supply. So they unloaded ships, uh, you know, were responsible for, for uh, mess duties, you know, and cooking. And, and probably the, the, the hardest thing they had to do is they buried a lot of the dead. And in that, there are stories of them facing de facto slavery, where they have uh, white officers that beat them and spat upon them because they wanted to get as much labor as they could out of them. And they were able to get away with that at this point in time because of just national sentiment and stereotype. And so they they went through all this, and then they come um, back home, and of course they're uh, uh, heralded as heroes, and racism was over. I wish and they everybody wish. lived there happily ever after. There was one group, the Harlem Hell Fighters, that were able able to participate in a victory parade in New York City. Um, another group that was pretty well known um, was uh, we had uh, James Reese's band. He was a famous jazz musician at the time, and they kind of traveled around France and, and performed. Um, so, so those groups got some recognition. But for the most part, uh, whenever these African-American men came back, they were, were not supposed to wear their military uniforms. We actually have stories of men that wore their uniform openly in the South and were almost lynched, nearly escaped lynching. Uh, you know, during the war and, and afterwards, these men who became officers, there was really never any uh, intent on them rising above the level of captain. We didn't want anyone to be a general level because, uh, you know, that might cause them to be in charge of white troops, and we can't have a black man leading white troops. Um, so none of these things they, they hoped for really um, occurred. We actually have one of the officers, uh, a man, Schuyler, I'm blanking on his first name right now, but he comes back and becomes an author, and he actually states – in some of his papers, that it would take another war to have another opportunity like they had just missed out on in World War I. And when you think about World War II, he actually is pretty pretty correct in that um, because really World War II is one of the things that does move the needle for African Americans, and we have the desegregation of the military. After that, uh, for Korea, which is another topic I'd love to – haven't done my research on it yet, but Korea is one of those other forgotten wars that's screaming for someone to go and look at African Americans' roles in that and what desegregation of the military actually meant. Um so, yeah, it, it wasn't what they hoped for, um, and that's why, uh, you know, there's so much that, that is found, and, and you can research about these men after they return and what they're doing in a number of different avenues to try to bring about equality and civil rights. You mentioned one. Who, who 
are some of the people that I might have recognized? You mentioned one. Who who are some of the people that I might the, have the recognized? One you're gonna recognize the one you're going to recognize first, I hope everyone recognizes, uh, Charles Hamilton Houston. Um, Charles Houston uh, was the, the leader of the NAACP's litigation team for a number of years. He's really the one who constructed, with the help of other attorneys, uh, the, the legal theory that goes into Brown versus Board of Education. Um, he passed away before that, and so Thurgood Marshall is kind of his protege and the one who brought that to the Supreme Court. Um, but he's, he's the most famous, I would say. Um, you know, right now, I'm blanking on just names of other men, but there, there are several attorneys. Uh, my favorite you know, attorney stories actually is not, even though Houston's so, so familiar, um, there was two in Georgia, and they actually had passed the bar before going to war. Really, after the war, uh, a lot of states shut down African Americans being able to be uh, lawyers. And so these two men um, basically tried all the cases for African Americans in the state of Georgia, especially in regards to civil rights. Uh, and one of these men uh, had a hearing loss due to the war. And so he could not effectively participate in in courtroom proceedings. So he kind of was the researcher behind the scenes. And then his partner, this other gentleman, he was the one who uh, went and really litigated everything in the courts. And so that story of those two men and kind of their, their partnering together um, and seeing how they impacted, you know, really a whole state, just the two of them, uh, was one of the stories I thought was, was great that came out of this research. So the book and was so published how long ago did you five years ago now. Well, four to five years ago now, I'm trying to remember exactly what the, I think it was 2015 was the publishing date. Um, and it was based off some research I'd done as my dissertation. So, yeah, I've, I've been about eight years away from a lot of this research and digging in. Um, I have been asked to come and present uh, papers and things at different times. And last January, uh, World War One Illustrated actually asked me to present a paper to them. So I've, I get back into it, uh, but it's one of those things where, where, uh, I'm always looking for other excuses to dig back in further and, and uh, do more research. Yeah, it's such an interesting, do more research. Yeah, it's such an interesting uh, and important topic, and it's an aspect of race relations that I think a lot of people uh, don't think about. Obviously, when you watch the news now, today, you approach it in a whole different way than people like us because you've got all this behind you. W- what is your, like, do you, are you working on any other books on I'm not, race? Um, and, I have and had some that students topic? that have gone forth, um, and, and one of them is working on uh, some, some work on the, the Confederate flag and what it means to different groups. And so um, she, she looks at kind of the, the, the claim of heritage um, and and talks about how that was an aspect back whenever you have some of these commemorations originally of um, Confederate troops um, in the cemeteries. And then she talks about how it's been kind of hijacked by different groups at different points in time and, and used f- as a racist symbol. And so she really, uh, it's interesting to read what she writes and, and to kind of see her research because it's trying to be respectful to both sides of that that issue. But she definitely always kind of points out that, that the, the difficulty is, is that that's a, been a hijacked symbol. And so... Uh, whenever you have, you know, that flag still on the uh, Mississippi state flag, you know, um, what does that mean to some groups of Mississippians or Americans compared to others? And so uh, that's one of the, the big ones. Um, I do a lot with online, so I don't do as much history as I, as I like to do. But the, the one thing that has been kind of a hot button issue the last few years, especially here in West Tennessee with, with Memphis, are the Confederate memorial statues, you know, and so that that's there's a lot of different ways to approach that and a, a lot of different ways, um, you know, to, to, to kind of side on how you think that we should, what should we do with those statues? My biggest difficulty is that, you know, sometimes they make sense to be in uh, cemeteries or on battlefields. Um, the ones that are on courthouses were usually put there for a reason um, by individuals that were trying to stake that public property as being white controlled or white owned. Um, I don't like the idea of just tearing down statues. I, I like the idea of somehow um, educating people about, you know, what that statue means. You know, there's some, some maybe some, some things about it that you might not notice that to the people that day they did pick up on and it was, it was clear to them. And then also um, talk about that history because that to me is the, the most difficult thing is that when we don't talk about our racial past, um, we don't try to reconcile that history that's when we get into to, to, to issues. Um, that's whenever you have people that feel like they're not represented or people don't understand their story. And uh, that's where you, you have you know, a, a lot of the, 
the problems we have today is that I think that there's just a miscommunication or misunderstanding. I think education is a big part of trying to bridge that gap. So you, you mentioned online. So tell us a little bit about what you do uh, beyond the history part. Let me tell you what I love part. about doing online. What do you do uh, at Day-to-day day stuff with the admin, you, you don't want me to put on a podcast. Y'all, y'all, y'all don't want to hear all that. But what I love is um, we really are able to meet students where they are. Um, it's, it's very flexible. I mean, it's obviously the, the big plus of doing an online program is you can take all those classes from your home. Um, and so, you know, we have people that for whatever reason, they may have stopped out of college, uh, life may have just happened to them, or you have also some 18 year olds who just, they, they want to stay in your home for some reason. Um, and they can get their education completely through our online programs. Um, so working with students is, is my passion. I love that. Um, I love working with faculty because online, uh, I think originally people thought, oh, it, yeah, I'll do an online class. It'll be easy, right? I'll just put everything up on a, in, in a course, and then it'll repopulate every semester, and there you go. It's like a correspondence course, but, you know, the 21st century. Uh, that's not the case. Um, you have to engage students or else they're not going to learn. Um, you all, that's, that's your, your business too, right? I mean, if the museum, you want to engage people that come in, um, and, and, and then that helps them to, to learn the material. And so working with faculty, talking about strategies and, and, and pedagogy um, and ways to really engage our students. That's what gets me fired up, and that's what I, I love to do. You know, being a teacher and having taught online my whole academic career, it was just kind of a perfect fit for me because I could get in this position and really work with faculty and show them you can reach this whole constituent of students that you're missing. You're missing this population, um, and you can do it very well. And uh, so that's that's whenever I'm doing my favorite thing at work, it's sitting down with faculty, sitting down with students, and figuring out how we communicate effectively with them and, and help them learn. Because there are all kinds of people who maybe currently don't still even realize they can take, you know, they can get their whole college degree um, taking classes online. Um, walk me through, let's just say I wanted to take a class in history. Um, walk me through a little bit about the process because I've never taken an so online class. So from the, the I don't know you know, beginning what, what standpoint, it would be like. it's the same thing as any regular student, um, you would just do the application process and be accepted. And then you register for the class, just like you'd register for any class. Um, that's when things begin to change. Uh, so we have a, a learning management system. Ours is called Canvas, um, that the whole course is kind of maintained there in that interface. Um, it's web-based, so you can access it from anywhere you have, you know, a Wi-Fi connection or internet connection. Um, and then generally speaking, most of our faculty kind of have weekly, uh, modules that, that have all the content that you would uh, be reviewing for that week placed in there. And so usually you, you, you watch a short video. We try to make sure they're short because, um, you know, it's, it's not supposed to be mimicking the, the lecture experience where you're on a campus and you're sitting there for an hour watching someone lecture. That's probably not going to hold a lot of people's attention. So, you know, uh, four-minute, eight-minute videos, probably more than one. You're going to kind of chunk some of that information. Um, and then – uh, you're going to do something to to assess to make sure you've gained that knowledge. There's probably going to be some some reading or something also in there, an assessment to make sure you've gained that knowledge. And then most of our faculty do some type of discussion or uh, other way to interact with students. And the idea being there to get them to engage with each other and talk about this topic and to make sure they understand it. Um, hopefully, we're doing things that are debatable, so it's stuff that you know we can actually uh, you know talk about. There may not be a right answer, but but we want to know what your voice is and, and what your thoughts are on this. And, uh, and get get more of that classroom experience um, and, and then, you know, have that connection, student-to-student connection, student-to-faculty member connection. Uh, and, and then usually, you know, that stuff is due anytime during the week. And so that's where the difficulty with, like, the discussions come into play is that, you know, we do know we have some students that Monday through Wednesday is not going to be good for them. So they, they miss out, you know, on, on that. But they can jump right. in Thursday or Friday and, and hopefully still feel like they're part of the group. And uh, technology just makes it so so much easier all the time because, uh, you know, you can, you can set up a group messaging on your phone easily and conduct all those students that way. Um, we have, you know, video capture, lecture capture type of, of things that even students, again, can access on their phone. And so – there really is a lot more where I will send out a video to students, and if they choose, they'll send back a video to me. And so we are at least seeing each other face-to-face, even though it's across the screen. But that, that, that software has just come so far in the last decade, 20 years, that um, it's unbelievable kind of some of the things we're able to do. 
Well, the whole the whole education system, I think, is going to continue in a, in a sort of a, a changing and growing and adapting, and you know, because it is a whole new world that we're all living in, and change is going faster and faster and faster. So, uh, you're definitely in the right business. Um, I like researching. Better. What do you like better, um, researching I, I, or writing? I enjoy writing as well. Um, the, the difficulty with me in writing is is that uh, I I edit. Very much. I, I, I believe that you have to edit it. And uh, I've been very fortunate, actually, uh, I mentioned to my parents, both in education, both of them were in English. So I kind of have built-in proofreaders there. And uh, my, my dad actually worked pretty methodically through my dissertation with me to make sure, you know, and it was great to have someone who didn't know the history. So he said, this makes no sense. Um, so that part was I enjoy. But really, the research is where you find those new kind of nuggets and those things that, that – um, Maybe no one else has found, or maybe you they found it before, but you interpret it a different way. Um, and so that's that's the part that's really fun for me. And and of course, um, seeing my students doing research and, and helping them just kind of, hey, did you think about looking here? You know, or, 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 have have you checked out this archive yet, or, or have you thought about this perspective? So uh, I really enjoy that. Um, but but you have to do the writing. I mean, you know, they're kind of hand in hand. But but I'd give this edge slightly to research since you asked the question. So I know you're super busy, but if if you were suddenly given a whole, you know, three extra days a week, what topic are you itching uh, to start researching well, and writing a I'll book? Be, about? I'll be selfish first to do the one that's just for fun, and then I'll, I'll I'll be a little more scholarly with the second one. So, so uh, first of all, I'm a, a huge baseball fan, a uh, huge Cardinals fan, and uh, I actually have taught a history of Amer- American history through baseball before uh, as a kind of a summer class. It was a fun class. I'd love to go back and actually write a book on that um, and kind of talk about how that that really, uh, you know, modern day, I know that, that football and basketball have kind of supplanted baseball as America's pastime, but for a long time it was our pastime. And you can see trends even today, but but especially, you know, through the 80s and 90s, um, things that are going on culturally that baseball is mimicking or baseball is doing something and, and, and culture is kind of mimicking that. And, of course, with, with Jackie Robinson, with with African Americans, you know, uh, um, crossing the the color barrier in baseball, and that being really a precursor to the modern civil rights movement, it's right there in my zone of also African American history. So, so yeah, love baseball history. Love to write a book on baseball history. Um, what I mentioned earlier too, the Korean War. I I really uh, my grandfather fought in the Korean War. Um, he's talked about it a little bit with me. He's actually, my brother also, uh, is a history guy. And so he's done more research and kind of some oral history with him. I'd love to go back and, and kind of look at the African-American experience in Korea, um, and, and kind of see, uh, how that plays out because, um, I've heard those veterans before talk about that and some of the, you know, how it was different, you know, and, and I'd love to get more of that thought process. And it's kind of the same thing that happened with this first book. I was just at the end of a lot of these guys um, still being with us. Um, and so, you know, I think there was maybe two or three World War One veterans that were still around whenever I was doing my research. And so uh, I was fortunate to have some oral histories that other people had conducted that I could, I could look towards. But to help capture before we lose some of these Korean War veterans, I think would be, you know, just very good work and, and, and rewarding work. And just, again, something that I'd be passionate about and, and would be fun to kind of dig into. And, uh, yeah, if I had three extra days a week, that'd be a good good start. Face it on the horizon. Not right now because uh, actually <laughs> Face uh, it on the horizon. Father, and I have three small children, so so three under the age of seven. Oh, wow. So uh, usually my research was done when oh, I was wow. at home, and so, I kind of uh, I had a, a room that was kind of blocked off and had papers scattered all about and on the floor. And that's just not possible right now with little kids. But – I do think that, that you know, uh, at some point uh, I would love to do that again. And uh, I keep getting encouraged by the faculty that I know and, and my former teachers I've had, you know, that, uh, hey, don't don't let it sit there all together. So, uh, so yeah. I, and especially if I could find a topic that maybe would be more of an article length or something like that, not a whole book, I, I could dive into that at, at any moment. Uh, do uh do any of your kids seem to have got the history gene oh, from the so, rest of so your family? Of all, do they love Discovery, Discovery Park? Is, is I know you must have brought to go. Here. And, uh, uh, the the little girl is is just under two, so uh, she's been here a few times, but but not been able to engage as much as the older boys. Uh, the boys, you know, we've done the Polar Express here a couple of years, and and they love that. Uh, we've come to some of the events you'll have in the evenings, you know, the different musical events, and and they love those as well. And then they just love playing here in the play area, doing the slide, but then also going around and uh, 
for whatever reason, I think they may be agricultural historians because they're drawn to y'all's uh, tractor barn that you have and really looking at the, those that machinery and yeah. trying to figure out what what it is. Uh, one of my oldest son has more of an engineering mind, I think, than maybe history mind. So so maybe he'll he'll bridge that gap some way uh, and, and do that. Well, hopefully someday they'll say that visiting Discovery Park is what. Yeah, well, sparked. hopefully someday they'll say that visiting Discovery Park is Thank what so sparked their engineering really mind. I really Thank appreciate you so much for coming and doing this with us today. And, uh, it was really interesting. Said, uh, I'm excited to, to come and speak to you a little bit about my research, and uh, just thank you all. And I've, I've actually, well, I actually, uh, I should have brought you all copies, but, it but uh, yet, it slipped so my mind. I'm, uh, I'm excited uh, to have it in my library. Okay, that sounds nope, good. I've you got one comment next time I see you, I'll get you an autograph. There in there because my grandma told me that we missed a, a typo. So uh, see if you can find the one typo she found. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> I'll see. I'll I'll see if Thank I can find it, but I'm sure I won't be able to. Thank you. And now let's go find out a little bit more behind the scenes at Discovery Park of America. Hello, I'm Andrew Gibson with the Education Department here at Discovery Park of America, and today I am with Casey Workman, who is the Assistant Director of the Aquarium and Wildlife Department, and today she's going to be telling us more about the facts and myths of everyone's favorite animal, the snake. So, Casey, how are you today? I'm doing great. I love talking about snakes. You love talking about snakes. A lot of people don't enjoy talking about snakes. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, roll off a series of questions, uh, true or false, and uh, I want you to answer them. Since these are the questions I have on the top of my head. Uh, true or false, venomous snakes have round eyes. Most of the time people are going to say that this is false. But it just depends on where you're located and what kind of snake you're looking at. So here in Tennessee, all of our venomous snakes are pit vipers and all of them have a slit eye. So in Tennessee, by rule of thumb, you're looking at a venomous snake if you've got a slit eye. However, if you go traveling down towards Florida, Georgia, along the coast, there is the coral snake, which does have a rounded pupil. Also, some of our most venomous snakes in the world, including the black mamba and the king cobra, have that round pupil. So next one, true or false? Venomous snakes have a diamond or triangle-shaped head. This is also a big problem. It is false, technically. Their heads are shaped like that at all times. However, I have a corn snake on display. If you come up here and see Steve, if he makes a sudden movement and I jerk and he gets scared, he's going to flatten his head out into a perfect triangle. It looks just like a copper head. So next true or false question, a snake's jaw... Uh, is disconnected when they are eating they're not actually disconnecting their jaw so their jaw is connected a little bit differently than ours so back at the back next to your ear ours is connected by a bone theirs is actually connected by a tendon which allows them to drop the jaw down also at the chin it is not connected like ours it is connected with cartilage and it allows them to move the chin sides independently of each other so this allows them to eat such large prey. True or false, the corn snake gets its name because it resembles maize corn. This can be true. It could be false, whoever you're talking to. Um, so there's two big theories as to where the corn snake's name came from. First one is the corn pattern, the maize pattern on their belly. Um, some of them have a checkered pattern. However, not all of them do. We do have an albino that doesn't have that pattern. The other theory is they're found in corn crips and corn fields where their favorite food is, which is mice and rats. True or false, snakes have eyelids. This is false. Snakes do not have eyelids, and instead they have a special scale that covers their eye and protects it from things like grass blades poking them and stuff. And once they shed, they'll actually shed that, so it'll come in new and repaired each time they shed. Now, do snakes have good eyesight? Depends on what snake you're looking at. So most of the snakes here in Tennessee are fossorial or terrestrial. They're on the ground a lot, so they don't use their eyesight a whole lot. But if you have an arboreal snake, which is one that's going to live up in the trees and hunt insects, they need to see better. And their eyes are typically a lot larger and huge on their heads. So you can usually tell when a snake has good eyesight just by the size of their eyes. And then my last question uh do milk snakes get their name from a wives' tale? True or false? True. Um, a long time ago, farmers that had dairy cows used to see these snakes going into their barns, and the big 
thought there was that they were actually going in and drinking the milk from the cows. However, once again, just like the corn snake, one of their favorite foods is mice. So they were going in there to try and look for mice. All right. Well, thank you, Casey, so much for for coming on today uh, and telling the world more about snakes. Uh, One little fact before we go, you can come meet Casey, meet Steve and the other snakes we have on display here. We have some fantastic, well-behaved snakes. Uh, We hope to see you here at Discovery Park of America. And we thank you all for listening to the Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast. Thank you for listening to Real Foot Forward. If you enjoyed this podcast, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a review on iTunes or wherever you may be listening. Plan your own adventure to see beyond at Discovery Park of America by visiting discoveryparkofamerica.com. Be sure to also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest updates.